Ready to get started? Yes. Okay. So there's an extremely important concept in organismal biology. Which is homeostasis. Who is familiar with this term? What does homeostasis mean? What does it describe? The body is in a state of equilibrium, like everything is working. Not necessarily equilibrium. So if you, if you literally translate this from the root words, homeo meaning same and stasis meaning state. So homeostasis basically describes a condition inside any organism's body where it maintains relatively constant conditions. So if something is in a state of homeostasis, that means its internal environment generally looks more or less the same. Now this is in terms of things like pH, or things like water balance, or temperature, or concentrations of various ions like calcium or potassium. Any organism is gonna to have to maintain a relatively constant internal state. This is, I think I mentioned why alkaline water is a scam earlier in the semester, because it's all aimed at raising your body's pH to somehow prevent cancer. That's a great example of something that you really can't do because the body has to maintain a very constant pH. In humans, it's something like between 7.3 and 7.4 pH. If you go outside that range, you die. We also maintain a relatively constant temperature. Who knows what body temperature it is? About 37, give or take. Remember, this is science, so we're working with Celsius, not Fahrenheit. If we were talking Fahrenheit, it would be about 99 degrees. The old 98.6 thing is based on an outdated study with a very small sample size. Turns out 99 is closer to the general average. But we also have to maintain that relatively consistent temperature. Now, if we're talking about something that is poikilothermic, remember I brought up those terms last time, poikilothermic and homeothermic, Poikilothermic being the more biologically accurate term for what we describe as cold-blooded animals. They can regulate their temperature, but it's done externally rather than internally. So something that has environmentally regulated temperature is going to be a less constant temperature, but it's still going to be more constant than necessarily the outside atmosphere is going to be. So something that we think of as cold-blooded, the blood's not always going to be cold, but it is going to be a lot less constant of a temperature regulation than we have. I really hate not being able to use my PowerPoint. I'm choosing this as an illness at this point, so I don't forget anything important. So then if we get into the systems of an organism's body, any organism is going to display something called hierarchical organization. Hopefully I don't misspell this. And you guys remember what a hierarchy is, right? Something that has various levels. So when we're talking about the organization of organisms and bodies, what's the lowest biologically relevant level? We're not going to go down into things like atoms or molecules. Cells. Cells. So the simplest living unit of the body is the cell. That's the first level of biological organization that we're going to be considering. Now when you go up to the next level, if you have several cells combining to make something, what is that? Tissue. That's a tissue. So tissues are groups of the same type of cell that come together and join together in order to perform some sort of function. So for example, you have a muscle cell. I guess I should have mentioned that cells, while animal cells generally all have the same parts, most of them are going to have 
a nucleus and ribosomes and mitochondria, etc., they can still be very highly specialized for the function that they're supposed to perform. So muscle cells, for instance, contain a lot of contractile proteins because what's the job of a muscle cell? To contract, yeah. So it's gonna have um, a high concentration of specific structures that allow it to perform that function. Now, when you get a bunch of tissues together, tissues are a large mass of the same type of cell that will come together in order to perform that function to a greater extent than a single cell would be able to. So if you have a whole bunch of muscle cells joined together, that's going to form muscle tissue. Because those muscle cells are specifically formed, or specifically um, designed to be able to contract, when you join them all together, that tissue they form is also going to be very good at contracting. Now, when you have a whole bunch of tissues joined together, what do we call that? An organ. organ. An organ, yes. Multiple types of tissue will combine to perform or to uh, form an organ or organs. So when you see this, you have different types of tissue containing different types of specialized cells coming together to work together and perform some type of function. When multiple organs join together, then what do we have? An organ system, yes. So when you have multiple different organs coming together, that forms organ systems, which would be things like the circulatory system or the digestive system or the respiratory system. Now in these systems, each organ is performing a different function but they're working together to achieve some sort of common goal. Like the circulatory system, for instance, what's the main goal of the circulatory system? Like That's how it achieves its goal. Transport nutrients. Yes, to circulate nutrients or gases. So the main goal of the circulatory system is to make sure that things like glucose and oxygen get delivered to every cell in the body. And to make sure that wastes like carbon dioxide or nitrogenous metabolic waste are going to be taken out of the cell so they don't build up and cause cell death. So the end goal of the circulatory system is right in the name, it's circulation of various nutrients and various gases around the body. It achieves this through the concerted actions of a bunch of different tissues and organs. You have the heart, for one. The heart is involved in doing the pumping and provides the pressure that flows the blood throughout the system. Also includes the blood, also includes the blood vessels, the veins, the arteries, the capillaries. Now, the system could not function without every single organ and tissue in the system functioning properly. They're all interdependent. Now, when you combine a bunch of organ systems, then what do you have? Organism. An organism. Yeah. Now we are at the level of an entire organism. In an organism, we have multiple different organ systems that are all working together to sustain life. So you have the respiratory system, and you have the circulatory system, and the digestive system, and a whole bunch of other ones. They're all performing different functions using their different organs and their different types of tissues. And like an organ system, this organism is dependent on every single organ system doing its job properly. If any single organ system stops functioning properly, the whole system crashes and the organism dies. Make sure I'm going through things over here. Okay, do we have any questions so far? This stuff's all relatively conceptually simple, right? Okay. It'll be done with this. There's another important concept in biology where we say that form follows function, or form is fit to function. Now what does this mean? So when we talk about form following function, what we mean is that in biology, everything is made the way it is for a reason. Nothing is just for fun. 
for the most part, any structure in an animal is going to be specifically designed to increase that animal's odds of survival and, of course, reproduction. Sometimes those can sort of be conflicting. My favorite example for that is the tail of a peacock. So the peacocks have these huge, colorful plumes of tail feathers. I'm sure you guys have all seen a peacock, right? Now, that's going to make the organism not necessarily better at surviving because it's huge and ungainly and probably makes the organism um, much more susceptible to predation. But it does work towards the ultimate goal of life, which is reproduction, because they use it to attract mates. That's sort of an extreme example. Usually, most of the features of an organism are going to be um, designed to make it better at surviving. So a great example of this is tuna. I tend to gravitate towards fish examples because that's my area of expertise in biology. So where do tuna live? In the ocean. Or in general, in the water. And this is important because water is roughly 1,000 times denser than air. So how's that going to affect anything that lives in water? So if you live in an environment that is 1,000 times denser than air, anybody, everybody's been in a swimming pool, right? Everybody can probably more or less swim, maybe not everybody, my brother-in-law can't swim. But has anyone tried to run through the shallow end of a pool when you're like up to your chest? What's that like? It's incredibly difficult. Because that much denser water creates a lot more drag and a lot more resistance on your body than air would. Uh, if anyone in here tells me you can run faster in water than you can in air, I do not believe you. So as a tuna living in water, any sort of unnecessary extra projection on your body is going to create a bunch of excess drag, and it's going to make that organism much slower moving through its environment. So tunas, over their evolutionary history through millions of years in the ocean, have developed extremely streamlined bodies. Has anyone here ever seen a whole tuna? Yeah, they look really streamlined, right? They just look like a little fish missile, or actually not that little. Anyone know how big tunas can get? <laughs> so the, the bluefin tuna is the largest species of tuna. It's also the most delicious species of tuna, which is why there's hardly any of them left and they're going to go extinct soon. But the world record bluefin tuna was caught back in the 70s, 1,496 pounds. The fish was like 10 feet long. It was incredible, the size of a car. So these things can get very large, but they always have this incredibly streamlined body plan to reduce drag as they move through the water. Tuna have also evolved several other mechanisms to make them faster swimmers. Without going into too much detail, they can actually keep their body temperature elevated above ambient water temperature. And since every process in the body is temperature dependent, that allows their nerves to fire faster, their muscles to contract faster, and that allows them to swim faster than their prey. Tuna can actually get up to swimming speeds of about 80 kilometers per hour, which is about 50 miles per hour. Can you imagine swimming that fast? It's probably really fun. But anyway, that allows them to be extremely effective predators. Coincidentally, the fact that tunas are, lar are long lived predators is the reason why there's so much mercury in their tissues. So don't eat too much tuna. Alright, where are we going to next? Alright, so now, does anyone have any questions at this point? What process generates these well adapted animals? We've already talked about it. Yeah, natural selection. So these traits, like any other traits, arise through the result of random mutations 
And if that mutation creates a beneficial trait, it's going to be selected for, and after enough time will become the norm in the population. Now we're getting into the part that's going to be difficult to do without the PowerPoint because I can't draw pictures at all. But <coughs> tissue types. So in the human body, most of the rest of this is going to be relatively specific to humans, we have a bunch of different types of tissues. One of them is something called epithelial tissue. Is anyone familiar with this? Isn't it like internal tissue? It's actually the exact opposite. So epithelial tissue is external tissue. This covers the surface of your body, both the internal and external surface. When I say internal surface, I'm talking about the surface of your digestive tract. So your esophagus, your stomach, your intestines, those are all lined with epithelial, epithelial tissue as well. So this covers the surfaces of your body and the surfaces of most of your organs. Now there's also a bunch of different types of epithelial tissue. And this is where it's going to get confusing without being able to use pictures. But you have several different types that serve different purposes and they're well suited to that purpose. So epithelial tissue is generally broken down into simple or um, well, simple epithelial tissue has one layer of cells. So the simplest type would be something called simple squamous epithelium. That describes, the simple part describes that it has one layer, the squamous part describes the shape of the tissues, or the shape of the cells. Squamous cells are just sort of like little square lumps. So simple squamous epithelium is going to be very thin and it's going to be very leaky. So in this case, you've got tissue that is advantageous for what sort of thing? What would that allow? There's this concept that keeps coming up all throughout the semester in this class of diffusion. So if you want to be able to exchange something across the surface via diffusion, that's where this simple squamous epithelium comes in handy. Other types of epithelium tend to be thicker, tend to have uh, much more cytoplasm in their cells. Those are great if you have a surface that requires lots of absorption, like for instance, the lumen of your intestines, the lining of your intestines. Those, have, those are lined with epithelial cells that are uh, designed to have lots of surface area and lots of cytoplasm to increase their capacity for absorption. Let's see what's the next tissue type we're going into. So what would be another example of epithelial tissue in the body? Anybody? Skin? Yeah, that's a great one. So skin is, is a multi-layer epithelial tissue, which makes it much more resistant to mechanical stress. So anytime you scrape your elbow or you know, my knee rubs on the inside of my jeans while I'm moving my leg, that's going to slough a few cells off. But because the skin has many layers, that makes it resistant to that stress. Now the next type of tissue we're going to talk about is connective tissue. What do you suppose connective tissue does? Right there in the name, it connects things together. Now you have multiple different types of connective tissue. The most common is loose connective tissue. Now it's called loose connective tissue because it's made up of a loose weave of collagen fibers, which is a type of protein. Collagen is sort of a strong rope-like protein. It's very long and thin. That gives connective tissue a lot of strength. Now those collagen fibers are also woven in with a lot of other sort of stretchier fibers, which also allow connective tissue to have a high degree of elasticity. So by using multiple different types of proteins with different properties, that allows loose connective tissue to stretch while still maintaining a lot of strength. What's the example? 
So an example of loose connective tissue would be like, most of what it does is it attaches things to other things. Like it attaches your skin to your body. It hang, makes sure all your organs stay in place. It's like that shape. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that, but I've got a good example here somewhere. Well, mainly, mainly what it does is it just tends to bind tissues to other tissues in places where they're not going to be subject to intense mechanical stress. If it's something like holding two bones together in a joint, that's when you use a different type of tissue, which we're actually going to talk about right now. So you use that loose connective tissue to hold things together if they're not subject to a whole lot of mechanical stress. If it's something else, then there's a second type of connective tissue called fibrous connective tissue. So this stuff uses really dense um, packages of that collagen fiber embedded in a more rubbery matrix. This forms things like tendons and ligaments. Now who knows what uh, tendons do? I know we've got some athletes in here. Muscle bone, there we go. So tendons are muscle to bone. Now what about ligaments? That's bone to bone. So anybody in here knows someone who's torn their ACL? Yeah, everybody probably knows somebody who does that, it happens all the time. So the ACL is the anterior cruciate ligament. You have three different cruciate ligaments in your knee, but basically what they do is they connect your femur to your tibia and fibula. So if someone tears their ACL, that's the one that goes right down the front. It's extremely painful and it's extremely difficult to come back from. But that's one of those ligaments which connects bone to bone. Now you can, you can probably imagine how the ligaments holding your bones together or the tendons holding your muscles to your bones are subject to a lot more intense stress than just the stuff that you know, holds your kidneys in place inside your abdomen, right? So that's why this fibrous connective tissue is there in place because it's much stronger. The next type of connective tissue we're going to talk about, well, make a few notes here. So the next type of connective tissue we're going to talk about is something that people may not think of as connective tissue. better. I'm not used to lecturing with just a whiteboard. Wow. You guys got all that, right? The connective tissues that are the, the uh, loose and fibrous connective tissue. So then we have adipose tissue. That's a possibly unfamiliar term for a very familiar substance. What is adipose tissue? Fats. Fats, yeah. Adipose tissue is basically fat. Now the way fat tissue works, or adipose tissue works, is you have a fat cell, or adipose cell, I guess. Best to use the proper terms. And that adipose cell, the way that works is, it stores energy in a fat droplet. So each of these adipose cells contains a single fat droplet that can either grow or shrink depending on how much energy is stored in it. What are the purposes of fat? Several purposes, especially in humans. Yes? Uh, insulation. Insulation is a big one. What's another one? Lubrication. Not lubrication. 
Well, I mean, that's a big one. Energy storage is one of the major purposes of fat. There's one more. So fat in your abdomen is often used to cushion and protect your organs. So you have something in your abdomen which is called visceral fat, and that's what surrounds the organs in your abdominal cavity, making sure they don't bounce around and bump into each other and get really bruised. That's part of why there's something called essential body fat. So most people want to have lower body fat as opposed to higher body fat most of the time because that's what Hollywood tells us looks good. But you have to have at least a certain minimal level of fat, otherwise you end up dying because your organs lose this protection. Now that also tends to vary between men and women because women need extra fat in order for storage of hormones. That's another um, function that uh, adipose tissue serves is hormone storage. Things like um, estrogen or testosterone, these are steroid hormones, meaning they're cholesterol based. That makes them fat soluble. So if you need large stores of hormones like women do in order to reproduce properly, you have to have extra fat to store all this estrogen. Now an interesting thing about fat, or about adipose tissue, is once you finish growing, you don't produce any more fat cells. Have I told you guys a story about this yet? Yeah, ah, I was looking forward to using that one again. Always gets people interested. Don't get liposuction, it's a bad idea. Alright, do we have any questions about adipose tissue? I think I remember which one I want to do next, but I'm going to check just to be sure. So the next type of connective tissue that we're going to go over is cartilage. Did I spell that right? Someone said no, someone said yes, someone said maybe. I did not. Yes, it is an A. Yeah, but I better not be giving you guys wrong spelling. All right, so cartilage. This is another one that's somewhat similar to the loose and uh, fibrous connective tissue in that it's largely made of collagen. Collagen is one of the most abundant proteins in your body. So remember what collagen is like? How did I describe it before? Not necessarily rubbery, but it's very strong and rope-like. So anything with large bundles of collagen is going to be very strong tissue. In the case of cartilage, you have collagen, which is embedded in a thick rubbery matrix. probably as good a time as any to introduce the unifying concept of all connective tissues, because you probably don't really see how these are all related to each other yet, right? So you remember all the way back when I talked about cell structure, when we were talking about the extracellular matrix, you guys remember what that is? So the extracellular matrix is the part of the cell that extends outside the membrane. It's made up of various proteins and carbohydrates and serves various different purposes. But the unifying characteristic of connective tissue is a loose matrix of cells, well, not matrix, but cells embedded in extensive extracellular matrix. So that's the unifying characteristic of everything we've looked at so far. So that loose connective tissue has a whole bunch of cells that exist in that loose weave of collagen fibers and other fibers. The fibrous connective tissue has more tight bundles of collagen. The uh, 
adipose tissue has those adipose cells also in a pretty extensive extracellular matrix. And here we're seeing the same thing. In this case, the extracellular matrix is much rubbery and much harder. Now that serves the functions of collagen, which are what? What's one thing, not collagen, sorry, cartilage. What's one thing cartilage does? Create structure? Yeah, it can be used to create structure. So what's one part of your body that uses cartilage for structural support? Your nose. Yeah, your ears or your nose. There's no bone in there. I'm sure you guys have all seen a picture of a skull somewhere. The ears and nose are gone. Because there's no calcified bone in there, the structure is provided entirely by cartilage. What's another function cartilage serves? Shock absorption, yes. You may have heard one of your grandparents complaining about how they have no cartilage left in their knees, which happens when you get old. So one of the more important functions of cartilage is it tends to cover the ends of your bones at the joint, and it provides some level of shock absorption so that you just don't have bone crashing on bone every time you bend your leg or take a step. So it's important in that function as well. Anybody remember an animal that uses uh, strictly cartilage for structural support? Sharks or skates or rays, concrete bees. All right, do we have any questions on cartilage before moving on? we're going to look at, which you may also not think of as connective tissue, is bone. Bone is also technically considered to be connective tissue. And it consists primarily of, you guessed it, collagen. But this time, the collagen is embedded in a hard mineral matrix. So in this case, it's somewhat similar to cartilage, except instead of that softer, more rubbery matrix, we have this much harder mineralized matrix containing things like calcium or magnesium. Now when you have that collagen combined with the harder extracellular matrix, what that gives you is a tissue that's both very strong, but also somewhat flexible. It's not brittle. If you didn't have the collagen in there, if all you had was minerals, your bones would be very, very brittle and much more susceptible to breaking. Do you guys all know that bones can bend a little bit? Yeah, they actually bend without breaking. Did you guys also know that bones have blood vessels in them? Yeah, we tend to think of bone as just this mass of minerals, because when you look at a skeleton, the bone is always already dead. But bone tissue is living just like the rest of your body, and like every other cell, must have gases and nutrients delivered in ways carried away. So you actually have blood vessels running through your bones, and when you break a bone, they bleed. Yes? Uh, uh, is it true that bones produce uh, new red blood cells? So not the bones themselves. The marrow. It's the marrow. So most of the time, your platelets are produced in the marrow. So if you have something like leukemia, it's a cancer of you know, the blood cell system, then you don't produce enough red or white blood cells. I'm actually not an expert in cancer, so I shouldn't get too far into leukemia. But yes, produced, blood cells are produced in the marrow, which is housed inside the bone. Anybody here have a broken bone? Yeah, I've broken a bunch of them. It's not fun. Any questions on bone before we move on? Um, I don't believe so because the bone marrow doesn't serve any structural function. But I don't know for a fact that it doesn't. You guys also know that your bones are constantly fixing little fractures that happen all the time? 
That's why we can't just like replace our bones with metal because metal wouldn't be able to heal itself. If you were to replace your femur with titanium, you'd have to get that titanium replaced every year or so because it wouldn't be able to keep up with the fractures. Now here's another type of connective tissue that always surprises people. People don't um, tend to think of this as a tissue at all, but it is. And that is blood. So blood is considered connective tissue because you have these red blood cells and white blood cells that exist in this extensive liquid plasma matrix. What's the purpose of blood? And so it serves several purposes. It uh, circulates oxygen throughout the body. Which cells are responsible for that? The red blood cells. They have that iron complex that's really good for binding oxygen and carrying it around the body. What's another type of blood cell? White blood cells. White blood cells. What do they do? Yeah, they're part of the immune system. So white blood cells are used to attack and break down any sort of foreign substance found in the body. Blood also contains platelets. writing this down as I go. So you have your red blood cells, which serve primarily in oxygen circulation. You have your white cells, which are involved in immune function. And you also have your platelets. Who knows what platelets are used for? Platelets are involved in clotting. So this is an important function in blood because if you have uh, tissue damage that's resulting in blood loss, the platelets can then coagulate and clot the blood and be used to stop the bleeding in minor cases. All right, does anyone have any questions about blood? Not the nervous system. It can be used um, to aid communication with the endocrine system, which we'll get into later. But it's considered connective tissue because it fits the general definition of connective tissue, which is cells sort of loosely dispersed throughout this extensive extracellular matrix. In this case, though, the extracellular matrix happens to be liquid. So there's skeletal muscle. The name implies that it's attached to the skeleton, which it is. In fact, some people consider the skeletal system and the muscular system to be one and the same. They call it the musculoskeletal system. But if you have skeletal muscle, that is what attaches to your bones, and that's what allows your body to perform any voluntary movement. walking around up here, or me riding on the board, or somebody throwing a baseball or something, those are voluntary movements that you're doing on purpose. And those all involve contractions of skeletal muscle, which is used to move your bones and therefore move the rest of your body. 
Skeletal muscle also has a different structure from other types of muscle. Uh, it's also called striated muscle sometimes because the way the fibers are laid in together give it this striated or sort of striped appearance. Now what's another type of muscle? Right. I'm actually gonna, okay good, I was gonna, gonna preemptively say it myself because that's the one I wanted to talk about next. You also have cardiac muscle. Where is the cardiac muscle found? In the heart. Now this is considered different from skeletal muscle because it is not connected to any bone. The heart is just a system of muscles and nerves which contract together in order to um, pump blood throughout the body. So cardiac muscle is used to produce the heartbeat. Now this is extensively branched with a lot of uh, complex connections between muscle cells which allow for the transmission of nerve signals, which then allow for the orchestration of the muscles contracting exactly when they need to, so that the heartbeat can be effective and pump blood throughout the body. Now it looks a lot like skeletal muscle. This is also striated muscle, but we don't consider it to be the same type because it serves a different function and is found in a different place. What's the third type of muscle tissue? Very good, smooth muscle. This is so named because it does not have the striations characteristic of both skeletal and cardiac muscle. Where is this stuff found? I found in the intestines or other organs. So smooth muscle's different structure gives it a slightly different property from, car from cardiac or skeletal muscle. And it makes it very good at long, sustained contractions. Now what this allows it to do is there's a type of contraction called peristalsis. A good example of peristalsis would be when I swallow a gulp of water or something like that. What you then would see if you could look inside of me is this sort of cascade of ring-shaped contractions going all the way down to my esophagus, forcing that water down into my stomach. Now because the uh, smooth muscle is really good at sort of those long sustained contractions, it can hold that and it can actually function quite well in that, uh, towards that end. Skeletal muscle wouldn't be very good at doing something like that because it's generally much quicker contractions. Okay, does anyone have any questions on muscle tissue? Yes? There's any muscle in the brain? No, I don't believe there's any muscle in the brain, actually. I could be wrong on that. But if there is muscle in the brain, it wouldn't be some muscle. Good question. Anything else? Okay. So now we go on to nervous tissue. What's nervous tissue used for? A couple of different things. Transmitting signals. What else does it do? So if it transmits signals from the brain, when it goes in the other direction, Nervous tissue is heavily involved in sensory reception. So you basically have a two-way street with nerve signals. My nerves are transmitting signals that my body senses about the environment surrounding it up to the brain. Then the brain is deciding what to do about it. And then it's passing signals back out, which result in the whatever my response is to my external environment. Remember that is one of the characteristics 
that is shared by all life is response to external stimuli. So let's say that my eyes see a train coming straight at me, then that signal is going to get transmitted to my brain, and my brain is going to say, if that train hits me, we're going to die. So it's going to send signals through the nerves to my muscles, which tell my, my legs to get me out of the way of the train. Now, when we talk about nervous tissue, the functional unit is the nerve cell, which is also called the neuron. Now, neurons are uh, characterized, I'm going to have to try to make a really bad drawing here. So neurons tend to have a cell body in the middle. And they have a few short projections that are called dendrons that are used to um, either accept signals from other neurons or from some sort of stimulus. And then you have a really long body, which is called an axon. And that's what the nerve cell uses to transmit its signal to other nerves. You also have other types of cells in nervous tissue that are called neuroglia. Those are used to uh, surround the neurons, make the transfer of signals more efficient, protect the neurons, nourish the neurons, etc. So you have two main types of cells, but the big functional one is the neuron. Anyone have any questions on nervous tissue? I have a much better picture in my PowerPoint lecture, which is already posted to uh, Canvas. So now we've gone through our tissue types. Remember we had epithelial tissue, we had connective tissue, muscular tissue, and nervous tissue. With those four main classes of tissue, we can make every other organ in the body. Or not every other organ, but every organ. So when you have an organ, types of tissue coming together to form this organ. And when you have those different tissue types joining together, they allow the organ to perform a function that is more complex than any of those tissue types could perform on their own. So a good example would be, for instance, the heart. In the heart, you have both muscle tissue and you have nervous tissue.
So that's organs in general. If you have any questions on that. Remember that it has to be at least two different types of tissues. If it's the same type of tissue, it's not an organ, what is it? It's just a tissue. Now, what was our next level of organization? Yeah. <coughs> systems. So it's somewhat similar in concept to what we saw with the organs, where you have multiple different types of tissue coming together to perform something that none of them can do on their own. There's a concept in, bi in biology that we call emergent properties. So at every level of organization, you see new properties emerging that did not exist at the lower level. When we have organ systems, we have multiple organs, if I can spell multiple properly. You guys probably aren't old enough to remember back when you had to write everything so you didn't have computers, but it's amazing how bad I've gotten at writing now that I'm used to using computers. So you have multiple organs coming together. to perform a function that is more complex than any individual <coughs> organ could perform on its own. What's an example of an organ system? Perfect, that's exactly what I was hoping someone was going to say. So, Is, any, is everybody done with this? Not much on there. So we have the circulatory system. What do we see in our circulatory system? It's the big one, heart. So it consists of the heart, It consists of the blood vessels. And what else? Oh, the blood, right? With no blood, the circulatory system would be pretty ineffective. So it accomplishes its end goal of distribution of various substances to every single cell in the body by the heart pumping the blood through the blood vessels. So this is a, another, it's an instance where we see a whole bunch of things working together to do something that none of them could do on their own. Now there's a bunch of systems that I'm gonna go through. How much time do we have? Oh, we're almost out of time. So another system, which I mentioned at the beginning of the class, is the respiratory system. What is the main goal of the respiratory system? A little bit more general than that. Gas, Gas exchange, perfect. So the main goal of the respiratory system is to make sure that the body can exchange gases with its external environment. That involves uptake of oxygen and uh, getting rid of carbon dioxide. What are the organs involved in respiratory system? Lungs are a big one. Lungs contain several different types of tissue again. They have muscle tissue, they have connective tissue, they have nervous tissue. So lungs are involved in taking in the gases. What, uh, what allows the lungs to expand? Anybody ever get socked really hard right here? You can't breathe for a few seconds? You know, you get the wind knocked out of you? What's happening there? Yeah, so that impact paralyzes something called the diaphragm. And even though it may not look like it, I know I spelled that right. So the diaphragm is some muscle tissue that sort of contracts one way to allow the lungs to fill up 
and then contracts the other way to allow them to close up and squeeze out whatever gas is in there. Other things involved would be the trachea, which is the tube that connects your mouth and nose to your lungs. Everybody's aware of the fact that you have two separate tubes in your neck, right? Yeah, you have the diaphragm, or the trachea and the esophagus. The esophagus is not involved in this system, though. Integumentary system. I'll spell this one out because that's a big word. And I'll hopefully spell it properly. So then we go on to the skeletal system. Who can tell me what's in the skeletal system? Bones, skeleton. Right there in the name. What's the main purpose? Structure. Without my skeleton, I would just be a quivering puddle of muscles on the floor. This also allows for all voluntary movement. You can't move, control the limbs of your body without having bones for the muscles to pull against. This one's relatively conceptually simple, but does anyone have any questions on the skeletal system? Okay. So then we go on to I think I heard somebody say it. The one that some people consider to be part of the same system with the last one, the muscular system. The muscular system, also pretty obvious what this one contains. Muscle. But only one of the types of muscle that we cover. Which one is it? Skeletal. Yes. So the smooth muscle and the cardiac muscle are not considered part of the muscular system. They're involved in different systems. Now what are the main functions of the muscular system? Movement. Yeah, movement. What's another one? Produces heat, very good. That's one that a lot of people don't tend to think of right off the bat. 
So your muscle cells have all those mitochondria in them. Remember that cellular respiration is only 34% efficient, so roughly 66% of the energy from the glucose is lost as heat as you're undergoing cellular respiration. So these muscles end up producing a lot of heat, which is really what allows us to maintain our elevated body temperature. Without our muscles producing heat, we would be quite a bit colder. Any questions on the muscular system? It's a pretty simple one. Next, we have the urinary system. This includes things like your kidneys, which produce urine. Also includes the bladder. It includes urethra. Now, what is the big, well, two big functions of the urinary system? What does this do for you? Yeah, it filters out and removes waste. From blood. What's another thing it does? You may not consider it. The urinary system is also involved in the regulation of pH and water balance. Now it's able to achieve this because when the kidneys produce urine, they produce it in a super diluted form where it's just full of water. Before that urine gets passed on to the bladder for excretion, some of that water will be recollected. That recollection of water is largely controlled by uh, how hydrated you are at the moment or what your blood pressure is like. So if you have really high blood pressure, naturally, uh, that's usually going to mean that you have a lot of water in your system. So your kidneys will recollect less of the water from your urine and just let it all go so you don't get hyperhydrated. If you're dehydrated, then it pulls, in, pulls back as much of the water as it can before that urine gets excreted. But did anybody here know you can actually die from drinking too much water? Yeah, it's a condition called hyperhidrosis. There have been several high profile cases. One of the dumbest ones was a radio show contest called Hold Your Wee for a Wee back when the Nintendo Wii came out. And it basically had a bunch of people just sit there and drink water at regular intervals, and the last one to get up and go to the bathroom got a free Nintendo Wii. One of the contestants died. So much water in her bloodstream that it caused a condition called cerebral edema, which is swelling of the brain. And the increased intracranial pressure uh, interrupted brain function to the point where she actually went into spasm and died. So be careful with this. There's also been cases of this happening in fraternity hazing. So anybody in here at frat? Do you have frats here? No. I, I don't know if you can call the Greek system or not. But if you transfer into your university and join a fraternity, and they're trying to be safe by making you pound water instead of vodka, let them know that that's not necessarily safer. <laughs> Fraternity pledges have died from hyperhidrosis after being forced to drink too much water. What's that? Did she always come a week? I don't remember actually. <laughs> this, was, this was like 12 or 13 years ago. The only thing I remember is that someone died. That sucks. Well, yeah, give it to her next of kin or something. Yeah. Alright, any, any other questions on the urinary system? Is anybody here curious as to why you pee so much when you're drunk? When you pee so much when you're drunk? Yeah, good question. So, it turns out that the what actually regulates how much water is recollected by the kidney before the urine is excreted is a hormone called antidiuretic hormone. When you get drunk, it causes a whole cascade of effects in your brain. But one of them is the fact that it suppresses the production of antidiuretic hormone in your hypothalamus. So without the production of antidiuretic hormone, your brain can't tell the kidneys to pull more of that water back, even if it needs to. So it's continually being excreted in that super diluted form that it's producing. If 
press friends. All right, I forgot what the next system was I was going to talk about. Digestive system, that's right. So what is the main function of the digestive system? Yeah. The, di the digestive system is involved in nutrient intake, which we do 